Hello, good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, and you're joining us here in the Techno Spirit, a panel promoted by Feminist Internet, together with CCI, to explore the connections between technology and spirituality for human flourishing. Before starting this, let me introduce myself. My name is Maria Dragzilla, and I was delighted to receive this task of organizing this panel and to look for people that would like to discuss such topics. In my journey, uh, many people actually didn't see much of a connection between technology and spirituality. But luckily for myself and for everyone that is joining today, we actually found three amazing panelists from different parts of the world that will be here with us tonight to discuss such questions and to understand how exactly these two apparently so distant topics can actually merge into one discussion. Uh, I could not go on without saying many, many thanks to uh, University of London, Creative Computer Institute for actually giving us the space and the opportunity to get these people together and to explore such topics. And also Feminist Internet, which I'm representing here. Very honored to be doing this on the difficult or not so difficult task of moderating such an interesting conversation uh, between people that have different experiences and very different approaches around the topic of spirituality and technology. I also would like to take, the, to, to take the opportunity to also talk about other ways you can uh, explore further the potential for internet technologies to make the world a fairer place. So if you are interested in such topics as this one, you might want to check the UAL CCI MA in Internet Equalities, which is offered as a one-year activity. Applications for 2023-2024 are open right now, and you can see the link on the chat, or just believe me when I say arts.ac.uk slash CCI. If you didn't get now, we will refresh it later. MA in internet equalities, because there you go. If anyone is curious how this works, we have an entity in this room today, which is called Cecilia on one side, and another entity called Georgina. Also, many thanks for this. Amazing people that will be helping us tonight with questions and other many gimmicks that we can use in this wonderful platform. Very briefly about me and why am I bringing Marina to this discussion is because Marina was the way I discovered to actually explore a lot of topics around uh, spirituality. That was my technology. And when I was when I met Feminist Internet and I was provoked to think about all these little questions that come together when we're talking about internet, when we're talking about gender, when we're talking about human development. So my history was long gone with spirituality, but very private. And then for the first time with feminist internet, I actually saw that was there was more people that was they, they were thinking about questions that I was thinking myself. And I was not sure that I could bring such questions to academia or to programs super structured and super rational that will never consider such a thing as spirituality. So here we are, and I'm very proud to bring to the screen our panelists, but not without saying a little prayer to open this amazing session that we're having today. Because in a way or another, this is also spirituality for me. To just to have so many people watching, but not only the participants, but the people watching at the same time in a virtual space, putting all the energy and the matter they have in their, their disposals to talk about such a complicated topic many times, 
for me it's already a blessing so i would just uh, would like to open the session in the name of time space matter and energy and then to conjure our beautiful panelists that are going to be joining us tonight ines faria mark pesce and ingrid lafleur wow hi <laughs> everyone welcome Hello. how are you great good yeah <laughs> let's start one by one i will choose randomly here yeah. time for you to introduce yourselves to our audience and talk about a little bit of where have you been what are you like have you been doing and mm -hmm. how do you see actually in your personal uh, opinion the connection between technology and spirituality mm -hmm. let's see very randomly here Ines, please start. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name is Ines. I come from the University of Lisbon. I'm an anthropologist uh, and I'm working in research mainly. And this is where I, I uh, ended up meeting Marina uh, and being called to participate in this panel. So thank you everybody for organizing this and for putting this together. Uh, it's not, I'm, I'm more on the academic side, so it's not every day that I get the chance to connect to people with other kind of takes on spirituality. Uh, my research concerns mainly technology, but digital technologies and specifically digital financial technologies. Uh, I have been working on blockchain and cryptocurrencies since 2016. And I now have a new project uh, which concerns digital financial inclusion. And I'm working about Mozambique. Uh, and I have been mainly articulating these ideas uh, connected to spirituality and a certain kind of symbolism and a certain kind of narratives, uh, even involving, of course, ritual and um, a kind of uh, religious uh, um, kind of ethos concerning blockchain technologies uh, and how these kind of imaginaries were, were being developed when I started doing research about this, about its potential, about its capacity to change the world, but also about a certain magicality slash fear that it provoked in the, in the first uh, people I was talking to about it. So there was this kind of environment of awe regarding the technology, uh, particularly because it was something that it, it was not very well known at the time, uh, but also this component of uh, uh, operationalizing this kind of magic feeling it provoked in non-connoisseurs uh, to, of course, uh, uh, enable a certain kind of power over people, over how people behave, over what kind of currency they use mainly through marketing discourses uh, aimed at uh, gathering people for certain projects and so on. So we had, you know, the Bitcoin evangelists, the blockchain evangelists, the blockchain experts, all those kinds of characters, uh, the kind of cyclicality uh, that was happening in, um, in the crypto communities with specific celebrations that were related to the way uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, for instance, behaved. So all these kinds of uh, more ritualized moments that were happening uh, in specific places where people gathered to talk about this uh, subject. So this kind of more secular rituals about around technology. Uh, I wrote about it with some colleagues, Sandra and Rafael, in an article, and I've kind of toy around with this kind of with these concepts and this, with this way of thinking about things. Uh, and even connecting it to other kinds of, of uh, religiousness and spirituality and kind of seeing uh, how it fits together. Uh, so this is more or less how uh, uh, it fits in my work. Uh, I also find it interesting to, to, to question and to think about it, uh, about spiritual practice to a wider extent, not only related to financial technologies. Uh, and I think it's really a very interesting and, and uh, wide uh, and varied 
uh, arena to explore. And I'm very curious mm -hmm. about the work of the other guests uh, and what will come out of this conversation. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ines. So actually, just curiosity, Ines was the first panelist that actually joined us because I found her article about cryptocurrency and how these crypto communities were working with this magical, mysterious ways. And I was uh, immediately drawn to that discussion. So we need a, a female per in personation talking about this, <laughs> this, this world, which is so masculine so cryptocurrency crypto dudes so for me that was like a great catch to actually find in this to join us so thank you very much on this i will pass the word now to ingrid which was the second person that actually uh, accepted to join us please thank you so much marina and, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation i'm happy to be here um, my name is Ingrid LaFleur. I am an Afrofuture theorist, strategist. I'm a curator and a pleasure activist. Uh, I am also a visiting fellow at the Modern Ancient Brown Foundation currently. So I am right now doing my residency in Detroit, which is also my hometown, and a place of um, of research. Detroit has completely informed most of my work. Um, prior to me leaving about three years ago for about 10 years, I have been really looking at what does it mean for Afrofuturism to um, show up in Detroit, influence how we see our futures since we were in and still are in a transformative uh, moment. Uh, I am currently a grad student at University of Houston in Foresight. Uh, so after many years of working in Afrofuturism and curating, um, I just really wanted to gain some skills for actually researching the future and really helping people and also organizations um, like figure out how, how the uncertainties of the future and even the emerging issues could affect their plans and their strategies. Um, and also, I just wanted to make sure that marginalized and vulnerable communities remained informed about what's on the horizon, especially when it comes to tech and science. Uh, and so that's basically what I focus on right now is helping people create uh, culturally informed futures and not uh, about these sterilized futures that we see oftentimes uh, in movies uh, or, you know, in literature, but really where our cultural traditions show up and, and really asking what do we want to take with us? And then that's the same when it comes to spiritual technology. Um, Afrofuturism, uh, I believe it, its foundation is spiritual technology. It's almost inherent uh, in the movement. And uh, it's really about helping us reconnect with all the spiritual technology of our ancestors and um, engaging with them in the now and really kind of bringing them forward into the future, if that's what we wish. Um, but then also kind of playing with how does that change our futures if we were to bring in more of the um, the magic and the, the metaphysics. Um, my father was extremely metaphysical. And so, you know, what does that mean if, if I'm like researching the future over and beyond just the systems that might be affecting my black body? Um, and so that's uh, along with just looking at foresight methodologies, my research uh, right now for my fellowship is really kind of um, experimenting with different um, methods and uh, I call it the Dinkanesh method. And the reason I do is because Dinkanesh, um, she was, uh, she's the name of a collection of uh, remains uh, that were 3.5 million years old found in what is now Ethiopia. Uh, so she's essentially the black mother of us all. And uh, I really like that as a starting point because uh, it, it kind of, 
suggests that perhaps we all have Afrofuture consciousness that we can tap into. And that's what this method does. It helps to kind of develop that Afrofuture consciousness so that as we're imagining futures, we can be as expansive as possible. And I, I believe this is all for everyone, regardless if you're black, if you're white or whatever. Uh, I think this is, you know, that's why Dinkanesh is our mother to unite us all. Uh, and as we move into the future, it'd be really great if we could like just honor our mother and uh, and kind of embrace that notion um, and and then kind of move forward in this nonlinear way. Uh, I think that's about it. Thank you. <laughs> While researching for this panel, I actually watched Ingrid LaFleur in another panel that we can share as a reference after, and she talked a lot about conjuring futures and uh, how important is the spirituality in Afrofuturism. So that was like, I was already super happy to have her in our panel, but then I was like, sure, like she's definitely has a lot to talk about this. And then Lee, last but not least, Mark joined us from Sydney. Thank you uh, for taking the time, for making the effort of like really waking up super early to joining us. Please uh, introduce yourself, let us know where have you been, what have you done, and how do you see spirituality? Thank you, Marina. As I begin this morning, what I would like to do is I would like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Yura Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging in a 60,000 year old culture, which is still informing ours. Now, you know, when we talk about techno spirit, certainly in the 20th century frame, those were always placed in oppositional modes. I mean, it goes back to C.P. Snow's Two Cultures essay from, what, 1960. I have always seen these two as completions rather than oppositions. And I think probably that started for me around 40, 45 years ago. I went to MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And in Cambridge at that time, it was heavily influenced by the work of Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener is the person who gave us cybernetics. And... He, he distilled cybernetics down to a single statement, which is that every process generates information that can be used to control it. Now, that maybe doesn't sound very spiritual, but at the time he came up with this idea in the 1940s, it was very raw and it was very new, but it inspired a generation of cyberneticists who followed in his footsteps. And the two greatest of those were Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela. And 1987, they wrote a book called The Tree of Knowledge, The Biological Roots of Human Understanding. And they explored an idea that for all of its power, rarely gets used as often as it should. What they said was this, look, whenever there are two systems and they could be people, they could be machines, they could be plants, they could be animals, and you can mix them up any way you like, plants and animals, man and machine, whatever. Anytime there's two, they are exchanging information with one another, and each exchange of information modifies the other. And as that exchange continues, those two systems, they become one in a process known as structural coupling. And thus, we are always becoming part of everything. And that sounds mystical. It is mystical. It's also essentially mathematical. And this is probably in my own life when I started to begin to see that these aren't oppositions, these are completions. And this took very specific form for me nearly 30 years ago in my work in the early web. And for people who, who may not be familiar with my history, I am the co-father of all 3D that you see on the web today. So if you see 3D in a web browser, this is work that I did with Tony Parisi in 1994 and 1995. When I started that work, it was clear that the web was about to become this universal connection to human knowledge, that we would all be touched by it, that we would all be brought into a coupling with it and through it into coupling with one another. And it seemed to me very obvious and very urgent that we needed to perform a ritual of blessing to reify the sacred in that new space, to invoke it, to call it forth, because, well, 
precautionarily, if you embrace the profane, you are yourself profaned, potentially. And if, on the other hand, you embrace the sacred, you're blessed, at least potentially. And it seemed that the wisest path forward would be to seek out that blessing. So I wrote and I performed a ritual of blessing in the Wicca tradition with a whole group of my friends. And I invoked the god Hermes Kybernetes, that's Hermes the Steersman, into the web in a ritual in October of 1994. That ritual was an intention to bless, but it was more than that because it was also an invitation. It was an invitation to anyone else who would encounter the web that they might intend for themselves to start to make sacred contact so that that coupling would also be blessed. Now that seems like a very simple thing because really it's little more than a cast of mind. It's a conscious decision to think of the web and any technology that we encounter that way, but it means so much because in that framing, and that framing is both mystical and also framing in the sense of Heidegger's The Question Concerning Technology, that framing is everything that we're holding within ourselves for ourselves. And although technology has grown radically more capable over the last 30 years, the principles there really remain unchanged. Because today we have machines that can speak to us and they're disembodied spirits that seem to possess intelligence but can also deceive. And we are warned in the first epistle of John to test the spirits. It's an excellent suggestion. I want to add another one. Bless the spirits. Frame them round with the sacred. And then when we reach toward them or when they reach toward us, we can remember who we are. And those couplings will not profane us. It seems a very simple thing. It's a conscious decision, and yet it would mean so much. Thank you very much. May Mother Internet be among us. <laughs> uh, one of the funniest things is just because I was introduced with uh, Mark's work by literally researching and finding all this that was in, he was involved with the creation of 3Ds. But mm -hmm. then I found this uh, this article from the the, the magazine Wired when actually Mark says he's a witch. And then I was like, wow, so the internet was actually uh, was created by somebody that was a witch. So I felt very touched that we were we are not alone on this. Like as crazy as we sound, uh, there is some some background on it. And taking this opportunity, I will read a question from the, the audience already because I want to join into this conversation. And Audience's question, should we perform a ritual of blessing for the new paradigm shifts presented by the RISE generative AI? If so, what would this ritual look like? Can you think about something? <laughs> From my own work in generative AI, pretty much the first thing that I started to ask these systems to do was to write rituals and to write spells, good ones. It, it, part of it was to see how good they would do at it, but part of it was also to say, okay, I wanna frame these relations around these sacred aspects. And of course we'll use it for lots of other things, but it always feels like if you're opening a bit of work with a generative AI, you may want to start with that ritual of blessing just to sort of clear the air and set the space for you. And remember, these things also hold context. So you're also changing it. In this, in what you have been researching on the cryptocurrency community, how is this rituals actually performed? There are rituals on these communities. Well, uh, there are some, but we, in the research we did about them, they were mostly, they are almost like secular rituals. And I think th the main component is that you have these symbolic moments like the Bitcoin halving, uh, for instance, uh, where 
the kind of whole global community gathers around a very specific moment in time. Um, I don't know if there is, uh, uh, I think there are sets of practices that are associated with this ritual. They don't have a, a very specific uh, thing, but I think it mainly concerns this idea of the boundaries of a community being, you know, made a bit stronger and everybody is sharing the same kind of event and kind of uh, connecting in that way, not necessarily in a place or through a particular technological interface, but kind of the, the feeling of it and the feeling of belonging of it. And of course, then there are all the other questions that concern the interest each person has in the specific event, in the specific ritual, and then you can, you know, it gets more complex, but I think the main thing and the broadest thing is this idea of community making, right? And and maybe uh, this idea, of course, of passage and all that that is embedded in, in rituals themselves. Yeah. Nice. Ingrid, in Afrofuturism, how, how is Afrofuturism digesting this idea that we might actually need rituals for <laughs> to strive as a, as a species also somehow? Well, <clears throat> within Afrofuturism, our rituals are very personal and that isn't like it's separated from our life. <laughs> like <laughs> we embody the Afro future, which means we're embodying any spiritual technology that we're bringing forth for that moment. And as Mark said, it's really about clearing the energy in the space so that when you are engaging with the tech, you're, you know, you're guided by that energy, if that makes sense. Um, and so that 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 probably is more of what we're about. But we really haven't had conversations around very specifically blessings of tech. Um, if anything, one time last year, I, I made a presentation and I talked about ancestral AI. Um, it was a speculative project um, where your ancestor would be able to be in this app and if you're stressed and overwhelmed dealing with I don't know like you have to go downtown and deal with some like government matter and it's stressful and you're confused you can like have the app with you and you know she might sound like your grandmother and be like and give you all this beautiful wisdom while you're like moving through this chaos and I was like dude this is amazing especially like both of my parents have passed on I'm an only child like I think that this would be amazing but the Afrofuturists in the room were like, no, I'm already connected to my ancestors. So um, it's it's more like the tech is this prosthetic, this thing that like you might need if you can't or if you're <laughs> unable to connect. But traditionally, our, that connection should already be there and very present. Um, and I'm like, a, I, I like both and I want it all. <laughs> I want it all because sometimes when you're stressed, the spiritual practice will like kind of pop out you can't remember you're so stressed you might be in a corner crying like oh my god and so it might be nice to have that app every once in a while to be like hey it's gonna be okay let me remind you of your spiritual practices let me remind you of you know the meditations the breathing the things you're altar making let me you know so i think both would be really nice honestly it's also <laughs> soothing to make sure that you have the, the the app even if you don't use it just in case like as an extra okay. resource it's like it's yeah, comforting no. somehow no yeah <laughs> um well going on the script because we had like a little bit of a script uh of questions that i want to explore with you uh Another thing that was always very, also very surprised when I was discovering all these topics about spirituality and technology is I believe a lot in coincidences. And as a coincidence, I found this book in a coffee shop. Sorry, I stole the book from the coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Age of Aquarius from Willem Braden. I don't know if anyone ever heard it, but basically talks about technology and cultural revolution. This book is from the 1970s and it's like whatever I felt this discussion about spirituality and, and technology was like super modern. In 1970, they, they were already writing about it and I will read like 
says to the beginning of the, the book, there is this quote, and they say, what finally divides the men of today in two camps is not class, but an attitude of mind, the spirit of movement. On the one hand, there are those who simply wish to make a world comfortable dwelling place. On the other hand, those who can only conceive it as a machine for the progress, or better, an organism that is progressing. From Till Hard the Chardin, from the future man. And that brings me to a question. Apparently, since the 70s, there is this very clear opposition between how bad can be technology and how good can be technology. So I wanted to hear from your perspectives within what you've been working. How do you see this? Is it like really a battle between, you know, this evil technology that's going to attack us and do the matrix? Or is it possible that we find these solutions where technology is actually helping us using the word that we chose for this panel, helping like for like benefit human flourishing? So if anyone wants to start, please just go ahead and try to give us your opinion. What do you feel? Is it super bad? Is it super good? Or is it like an endless blurred line between those two aspects? Yeah, for me, it's it's not even a blurred line. I think it's an endless tension between those two. And the thing from my experience is how to keep that balance and how to keep the relationships between technology and the scientific knowledge and these ideas of progress and at the same time acknowledging that they are also constructed according to a particular way of of seeing the world and of knowing uh, things uh, and also uh, uh, other kinds of perspectives that see technology as very bad and i think that there is then there are good things in the kind of intersection of the two uh, and in, in the issues I have been researching, there are aspects that are very clear, but that are much made much more complex because there is money involved and there are financial relations involved. So that kind of brings yet another piece into the puzzle of is this good or is this bad with financial inclusion? You know, of course, it's good in a way, but what are the, the, the pitfalls? What may happen? What are these kind of applications? bringing to people and how are they programmed how are they developed and with blockchain and cryptocurrencies it, the same thing happens so there are these kind of permanent tensions that i see as tensions and as needed negotiations but not only as as this you know kind of separation and and i think we should really learn learn from these processes in in dialogue yeah Damn it! I was looking for like at least if I'm if I'm fighting for the correct like the right side, but there's no answer, right? Okay, fine. <laughs> Ingrid, do you want want to contribute to that, Mark? Well, I really think that um, it's going to be, you know, how we use the tech is 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 really what it is all about right and um and who's at the table when creating the tech and that's why we want more diversity um not just culturally or racially or but also diversity of thought and um and i think that's what's key here uh because we already know the tech can be used for bad like it already has happened <laughs> and and it's you know like facial recognition has already uh, criminalized people who have no you know haven't done anything right and so um, we already know that it can it can go really bad um, but then at the same time it can be really good and so it's just really about our society more than it is the tech itself um, and that's why I love Afrofuturism because it, it helps to introduce these ideas or, um, or introduce the tech um, without all the fear around it. It kind of introduces the possibilities. And as long as we can focus on like its possibilities for good, um, it can kind of reduce some of the anxiety around what's being created because there's, there's a lot being created that we're not talking about at all. <laughs> 
<laughs> and every time I come upon a report, I freak out in my room so I'm like by myself. And I'm always wondering, do I share this information? Is this relevant? Can people be prepared if they got the information? Is that being prepared um, or informed? Or is that just random information because that tech isn't really going to do anything today? Um, but it's still in development, right? It's so, and, you know, how do we in our, insert ourselves into these conversations? Like, I don't know how to insert myself into synthetic biology combo, <laughs> but I think we're going to need to have that. I mean, talk about spirituality. And <laughs> like, I think we need to have that conversation, right? Um, but I, you know, I don't know any synthetic biologists to talk to or anything, right? So it can be, feel a little overwhelming if you're trying to like, make some, you know, kind of shift a development in a particular direction. Um, but all the same, I, I really think that people should be digitally literate um, and then make the choice on their own if they do or do not want to engage. But everyone really should be exposed to what is is present. And as a, a Black person, we're often not exposed. And so therefore, we're always, we become the victim of or the consumer only and instead of the creator and and that's what afrofuturism kind of like pushes us to be like okay there's some emerging tech like blockchain tech if you can use it in a capitalist way or we can create these digital cooperatives and use it in a way that really strengthens our community and create our own economic system and that is its own spiritual you know like the the movement the exchanging, that's exchanging of energies, right? And so like, that's really important. We can insert that or we could not and just have an investment club. So like, you know, <laughs> it's like, what do you want to do today? <laughs> or you could do both, <laughs> actually. Could I, I use what you just said? Because this goes like to a, a, a question that I could uh, take Mark on board because we know that most of technology is actually being used for control these days. There's a lot of issues on control. Mark has a beautiful talk about the society, like literally being under control and how this technology is being used for that. So I would direct this question to, to Mark now, and please uh, Inez and Ingrid can also uh, contribute after. But Mark, how do you feel that in this, societies that are being more and more controlled by technology is being spiritual or actually looking for human development goes against or pro this how does this surveillance actually reads if i if i go in google and look about i don't know witchcraft is this a good point or a bad point Ooh, that's a that is a very very rich question right there i mean i think at one level when you start moving away from the mass religions or you start moving extremely deeply into some of the traditions in the mass religions you are moving into a space that has in some sense evolved to evade certain classes of surveillance it makes it it tends to make itself quite available to other classes of surveillance which tend to be peer-based so if you're in a monastery, for example, or if you're in a coven, you're responsible to those folks, but you're not necessarily quite visible to the surveillance apparatus in the rest of the world. And that is a very long tradition. <laughs> Look who came to visit. That is a very long tradition. We know this tradition from ancient Christianity and, and the Christians hiding in the catacombs of Rome, right? This is not a new thing. We know this from the mystery cults that predate that and so on and so forth. So it is clear that spirituality has become continuously throughout history a way of confounding the surveillance apparatus of the state. But at the same time, of course, as we can see, now I am by birth an American, and we know that America has its problematic natures right now, and one of them is that there's a conflation of the religious with the state apparatus in America, and that is being used as an instrument for surveillance over women's bodies in particular. And so we can see both of those forces at work there. I think that 
you won't get a solution to this, but what you will get is a spectrum of possibilities that people will be able to explore to the degree that they're willing to tolerate disappearing from the world. Because you do also pay a price for the lack of surveillance. Ines, anything to <laughs> add to yeah, question? It's, it's super <laughs> ambiguous, but it's true, yeah. It always comes, you know, it's all in the middle and kind of a process. You can't really, you know, opt for one side or, or the other. I was thinking about surveillance and I, I was thinking about what you were saying about this kind of being hidden, the secrecy, the, the being out, being part of the the, the different kinds of, of positionings and the price it costs. And also about these issues of, of you know, enforcing power and and social control and to the extent that you are willing to bargain on it and and what did you you can't really reach any conclusion about this it's just we are always kind of negotiated in in, in between these kinds of spheres right it's it's difficult to to give a straight answer to 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 the question yeah there is no straight answer no no <laughs> Gladly, we're very queer here. The straight answers are very difficult. <laughs> Ingrid, I think like for when you talk about Afrofuturism and Afro communities, like technology has like a very bad impact in terms of fa a system that uh, recognizing facing systems actually that are not even capable of identifying like a, what is a black face so there is all this stigmas that actually get perpetrated because as you said there is no actually a lot of like black people doing technology and they're basically receiving technology is it do you feel there is like is it this is one front we should be working on on actually getting more people like more diverse people more black people more indigenous people to actually make this to technology to try to kind of at least <laughs> dissolve dissolve some of these big not like problems that are like getting starting to show up in this in this process most definitely most definitely we definitely need um more more diversity for sure i think though okay so recently it came out uh that certain police departments want to use an, an ai app that will create uh police sketches um because they want it fast um but the problem is it doesn't deal with bias right so again like um it's it, i think the issue definitely more need more diverse creators but the bigger issue is that people don't really seem to understand um what how bias can show up in the tech and or they or they don't care right so in detroit uh, our mayor just completely ignored all the activists and instituted the facial recognition anyways <laughs> So he's being educated and completely informed and knew that I think it's like 80% of the time it misidentifies black women. Um, and so, <laughs> and he did it anyway. So like, I think that um, it's it's an education issue is probably a one big, big part of it. So we can have the creators, but I think people still need to be educated around the tech and how it could be used causing harm and we don't want to continue systemic racism and racial profiling anymore, right? We don't want to bring that into the future. We're, it's over, like <laughs> leave it back here. So why are you creating, you know, using this tech that is only going to further create that, right? And on a, a on an immediate level, that's probably our biggest issue is that it, either people aren't informed or they just don't care. I don't know, it's a morality issue, <laughs> possibly. Um, um, but then, but we do, right now, we do have some really amazing people who are working in AI and really informing us of the biases and, 
And so, you know, that is happening and there are definitely organizations who are really helping to support um, the education of uh, people of color or the global majority, as we like to say, um, to, to really get into the tech. Um, but on a, on a social level, education, like we need more education around that and just education and period, right? Of our histories, of our, everything, everything, everything. <laughs> United States. <laughs> one of the like the funniest things that whenever I, I was building up the panel and I would bring up the discussion with you know let's say regular tech workers, most of them would say, "Of course, technology is good." People have no doubt. Sometimes they're like so full of this mm -hmm. certainty that technology cannot harm us, and then when you bring these conversations on. Uh, how tech can actually uh, perpetuate some things. People get very like surprised by it. Like, like, oh, really? So it's like, and then when you start to realize how the algorithm works and how this actually, this, it's all being used to somehow kind of not only control you, but influence you is when my question is like, can we actually have uh, technology which is not uh, manipulating us uh, i don't know in this in, in in this side of mark tell us your <laughs> the answer is yes but that requires a continuous and conscious set of choices in design in choosing your audience and how you're interacting in other words that is not a one-off and i think a lot of people think oh well we tick the ethics box or we tick the bias box and we're done here and then the thing goes out and and destroys and they're like oh how did that happen well it's because and i'll come back to this idea of cybernetics which is that the output of a system needs to be fed back into the system as its input in order to bring that back into line with what we want because that is how we control and i don't mean control in the domineering sense but in the steering sense like that's how we engage in that dance and i think part of what we think is that technology is an object it's a hammer or in fact technology is more like fire and we need to keep our eye on it or it will burn the house down <laughs> That brings me to another question, which is open to all of you. Also for the others, please share with us what are your feelings? Because when you talk about spirituality and tech, one big question, and at least that's for me, out of coincidence, like out of curiosity, I read tarot cards. I like the practice. I, I like the rituals. I think it talks with me. But then there's whatever you do, whatever practice in the spiritual there is this calling of sharing with everyone and taking money out of it somehow which is the commodization commodiza how do you say Com commodization commodization i'm going to say it wrong can somebody please correct me commoditization please thank you <laughs> so Ines, please tell us well, how do you talk how do you feel about the commoditization of the this this spiritual spiritual talks that we're having about internet and then we, we go back kind of to the, the question that mark just answered in terms of can we have do you believe we can have like altruist uh technology that doesn't go along with making money out of it or not give me your opinion i think uh uh we could and uh and I think in the end, as we were discussing, and I think it's a, a, a thing that will come repeatedly, it depends on who's been besides now behind it, and creating the the things and the platforms, of course. Uh, I But also, and I, I wanted to go back a little bit before I go into the, the more spiritual side, because I was thinking about this kind of morals that may be imprinted into platforms and the kind of thinking that goes into platform design and into solving problems through technology. And I think that there are two kind of two layers or two dimensions to this that I that I found particularly important. And, and this was very clear when I was talking to a developer that kind of figured out these, these differences in, in how we think about technology. And he was saying, well, for me, there is a problem and it's very well defined and there are a set of parameters and there are a set of things I need to do. And what I want to do is to solve a technical problem. And I'm not very worried about whatever 
comes out of it. And I think what is needed is this idea of, no, you have to worry about what comes out of it. And it's not only technicalities and it's not, you know, it will go way beyond the concept you, you, you kind of, you are trying to prove or the technical aspect you are trying to solve. Uh, and, and I think this is also the kind of slippery part of this more technical solutionism and, and technological embeddedness in our lives and in spirituality as well, because you are kind of mixing very different things. And if you are commoditizing these applications that have, you know, the astrological uh, profiles and you have the networks and you kind of collect data on people based on their preference for this kind of spiritual practice. And I'm sure there are others for Taru. Uh, I also came across uh, these apps that send nudges. So you are kind of permanently connected to a gadget that keeps, you know, sending you stuff. And to what extent is this then, you know, you should be maybe managing your, your spiritual life and how you want to practice it and when you want to do it and creating, you know, the safe space to do it. And how does it work and what kind of relationship is it established when you kind of have this constant nudging uh, uh, about, you know, with different kinds. I've seen things with, you know, um, uh, Bible excerpts and, and things like that. So for more uh, heavily institutionalized uh, uh, religious practice, but also from others, from astrology apps, for instance, as well. So I think there is this tension and, and there is this very intricate relationship between money, religion and technology. But then I also think that between religion and money, there has always been a very strong relationship <laughs> and systems of domination. It was just like, wow, yeah. And, and then technology is also there as well, because in the end, money may be considered a social technology. So I think we are kind of dealing with very similar dimensions than we have talked to in the past, but in totally different configurations. And that kind of enter our lives in a much more subtle, but slash intense way. But I don't know. I'm just picking my brain. We don't have to know it. anything. We're <laughs> just sharing here because yeah, yeah. It, I think it is quite a topic where people have a lot of just thoughts and we don't still hold the answers, like the, the final, like the decisive truth. So this is the moment for us to actually discuss and just to start mm -hmm. finding these answers. Ingrid, want to add anything on the com commoditization aspect of technology and spirituality how do you do you use these apps for the insights for the patterns for the astrological waves for i don't know what 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 are you using on your phone on that says tell us <laughs> Yeah, so what I do actually is take Instagram off my phone so that I can like focus in my real life. Um, and so I think that that's probably the issue is that the disruption, like the it can disrupt a connection that you might be maintaining and then you get on an app and then it might disrupt it. Or if you have a really great feed like I do, a lot of spiritual messages will pop up or really like, you know, love yourself, celebrate yourself messages. Um, I follow quite a bit of people who do um, that kind of um, posting. And I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, I don't really have too much of an issue. I mean, we're in a capitalist society, so people do need to make their money. Uh, I just appreciate the spiritualists who aren't necessarily selling. I think, that's the difference. They're just giving information. If you want to know more, you just go. But the the selling part is when it gets icky and it feels less spiritual to me. And um, and we we've seen that you know in, in our um, analog worlds, you know, with churches and and the way that they are able to to gain money. So they use the tech to just expand that empire and to get more money <laughs> and to be available even more instead of TV. Now it's, you know, a computer. It's, you know, we've been dealing with this for a while, uh, especially in the U.S. with our TV evangelists, right? So it's just a continuing of that legacy. Um, 
but I do see that it's not as important. And I think what is the best is when people are just inspiring you to like kind of move into your own spiritual practice and then you can just follow them if you need more inspiration. Ingrid, <laughs> I'm looking at the questions. Yeah. <laughs> why, <laughs> why you read that? Just quick uh, adding up. I've been monitoring my uh, fed on the on the social network you just mentioned. I will not repeat for, I don't think they need the, the marketing. And it's very funny that like it's, as far I don't I like to think that uh, is not recording because I always turn off these options, you know about other oh, listening or not. But I just had a conversation with friends about learning German, and so, like the other day, my fed was like for three days about learn German lessons, jokes about German, and it's like I so I start to become aware that. Depending on the topics of conversations I'm having on my real life, my phone actually interacts with me in very different ways. So it got me very scared about these applications that actually send you some insights and try to read your horoscope or your site. And I'm even like someone that believes somehow in astrology. But then when it comes from an app and you realize that you're getting... It's not only your your constellation or the time you were born or the place, but actually every information you put in that system and is actually being used against you. You can be actually maneuvered very, quite well to any direction you like. They would, anyone would desire. So that scares me a little bit. <laughs> Mark, tell me what are your perceptions? Do how is your relationship with your Fed? Well, hi. There's, there's a lot here. I think one of the things we want to point out is that although we don't necessarily like when money and spirituality pollute one another, often that's the cleanest possible relationship because it's transactional, right? And there are, and Ingrid, you probably know a lot more about this than I do, but there are a number of West African religions where you make offerings and it is very transactional. You pay and you get this. And everyone goes away happy because everyone knows what they're getting in the transaction. And so there's a there's a space for that, which is which is not abusive. Right. As opposed to, again, another coin of the realm, particularly in the now mid 21st century is attention. So that when Instagram is sucking you into it and it's funny, Ingrid, because one of my friends also deleted Instagram off her phone this week in very similar circumstances, I think probably to yours. And we realize that that is a coin we don't want to pay because we don't actually know what the contract is. <laughs> we don't know what we're giving over. And it feels as though one element of the sacred around this is a kind of transparency. Like you can't see into the sacred, but you should feel comfortable with the, with the nature of the relationship. And if you don't, then that's actually telling you something about how you need to protect yourself in that space. That leads me to another question, which is something that I always think to myself, and I would like your help to try to find a solution, at least for ourselves. What is the solution in like? Not there is no one solution, but let's just uh, talk about this aspect. Would it be just to use less technology, for example, and reconnect with nature, with physicality, with like uh, like matter? Or can we actually develop spirituality through this technology? Can we actually use, even though sometimes these contracts and these exchanges between money and what we're getting are not very clear, can we actually use this uh, this technology still to develop ourselves? Or, or the solution is just like avoiding uh, getting out of the, the apps, uh, uh, trying to, because trying to control seems tricky. Does anyone has an opinion and wants to start with this tricky one? Ingrid is like, oh, there's no one solution. Well, the binaries are always tricky, right? It's it, yeah. it generally is not, I've got to throw this away or I've got to throw this away. 
but it's not I, what I mean, certainly there's a lot of people establish rituals in their own lives. Like some people have that unplugged day every week. One of my friends wrote a book about how she unplugs with her family basically every Saturday and they just do stuff and they put everything away. People want them. They can call them on the landline and they've established a real ritual around this and they found it's really given them something. So I, I do feel rituals of unplugging are really important for us and we are really not good at them because all of the devices are trying to help us resist that desire to unplug and to look up. So it feels like the more that we can conspire with one another around the rituals of unplugging, the better off we are. But it is not about one versus the other. It's about how do we make ourselves the best we can be and give ourselves the most agency with one foot in both worlds. Because that world of the internet technology, what that's kind of also another expression of the world of our mind, right? And so we don't want to cut that off, but we do want to be able to regard it with some level of safety and agency around it. Agency. How is the agency factor within the cryptocurrency communities in this, with this idea of, you know, the holy grail and I can actually achieve, you know, because I heard and I read your material and in crypto, there is a lot of this, you know, using exactly the same rituals of, you know, there's something which is called almost like the Bible and there's something that they adore, they really go for it. Is there like, do you believe there's like true agency, like uh, someone inside of the crypto uh, uh, system, whatever game is being played, can actually win this game? Or is it like something that is completely controlled and influenced by external factors? Well, um, I think it's something a lot influenced by market factors and by, you know, just market dynamics and speculation. Nevertheless, uh, you can have a, a more specific kinds of agency towards different kinds of objectives, but still, even though you want to build something or create a particular community, following a particular direction and participating, for instance, in, in, in specific in rituals with specific kinds of symbolic functions. Um, you, you, you have to always be aware that all this is kind of embedded in this super volatile market and that to the, the, the I, and it will always be influenced by, you know, the oscillations in the prices of cryptocurrencies and how they relate to the pricing in fiat. And I think mm -hmm. that's, there are, and there is lots of agency and there are lots of different projects, but this is something that kind of goes all the way in the back and, and, and progresses over time. And I think it really influences what's happening. Maybe that's the reason why there are so many rituals and these kinds of practices because there is so much uncertainty. Yeah. There is a lot of faith in crypto, no? Like yeah. you really have to have a lot of faith. Yeah. But anyway, um, can I uh, explore a question from the audience? So we have a question. AI has an image problem. A typical AI article always has a robot. We anthropomorphize AI, which traps us into human tropes. For example, AI as an antagonist. Can the images, symbols, language of spirituality help facilitate more realistic and diverse conversations around the applications of emerging tech like AI? Cecile, our entity, will put this on the screen for everyone to see and, and check. Mark, do you want to start with this one? No mic, no mic. <laughs> My apologies. Yes. When, when I was doing some of the background around this, two of the things, and I've been thinking about this for a while, when we talk about, and we haven't said it yet, uh, I'll light some sage to say chat GPT, sorry, but no one's mentioned it yet in this, but we all know that's sort of informing all of this. And we're trying to find frameworks to sort of, how would we think about them? And one of the, there are, there are two near analogies. One is the, the concept of the jinn, 
which is actually pre-Islamic Arabic. And it's disembodied and yet somehow can also have children <laughs> um, and is in fact subject to judgment. So if it, it's not good, it goes to the bad place. If it's good, it goes to the good place. They can help people, they cannot. You know, we know them as genies in English. That's how that term has come down. And we also know that they're playful and fickle and all of these different things, and we can't necessarily trust them. And they have a cognate equivalent in Hebrew, uh, which is the Shadim. And again, it's, it, they live in that middle ground. They're not angels. They're not devils. They're kind of, and you have to sort of be careful with them. And it, it feels like there's a whole set of spiritual understanding, which goes back a few thousand years now, that we probably want to start to explore. The danger here, of course, is that we try to force that onto the thing because it's not, they aren't exact. None of these things are exact, but human beings have been thinking about these kinds of relationships and these kinds of forces for a long time. Ingrid, thoughts on this? Can we use the images, symbols, and language of spirituality to help facilitate more realistic and diverse conversations around the applications of emerging tech like AI? Uh, sure. I think, you know, as long as the spiritual elements are quite diverse, right? If, and uh, so we might find that spiritualists lean towards more Euro kind of Eurocentric view of spirituality. And that seems to dominate within um, the tech space. And so making sure that like spiritual practices from the global South are in, inputted and, and, and present. I'm interested to see what that can have, what, what that can create, honestly. Um, and as I play with like, for instance, I play with like mid journey a lot and uh, and I'm going to be playing actually this morning uh, I had a meeting and um, we were looking at different Haitian symbols and I was like ooh I wonder if I what would happen you know so that it, 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 I think it's a really good space to be in and to think to, to this line of thinking I think is really really healthy um, if I may just take this moment because it kind of connects this person asked the question to me about um, they were saying that learning the tag has kind of brought them to learning some of the, the Viking symbols or runes. Um, and then thinking about um, and how colonizer blood will be within us. And um, uh, I will say very specifically that uh, I embrace all my bloodline, no matter how it came, um, because it brought, it made me. Um, and, you know, so when I'm in Europe, I'm like, this is my home. <clears throat> <laughs> and so, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I have French blood, I have Irish blood, like, you know, so, and it, it can be, it's a complicated history. I do believe, though, for our own individual mental health, it's better to try and figure out how to connect with those colonizer cultures that might be inside of you. And, um, and through, I, I usually connect through spirituality. Um, and so I think that that is like the healthiest way to, to go. And, and it sounds like you already kind of went in that direction, but to keep going in that direction can really be a healing moment because it does need to be, uh, it needs to be healed in all of us. All of us probably have that bloodline in us. And so, um, to really like focus in on that and, um, and to really be intentional about acknowledging it. And then that is the first major step to healing. Most of us are too ashamed to do that, or it causes too much pain, it's triggering, you know, but to really kind of move through that and face it, and then kind of like go through the culture and the spirituality, I think is really great. But yeah, I it's something that I think about often. And I think that that's the, the reason that race is so annoying because it flatlines us. It doesn't really allow for these kinds of complexities that exist within us. Um, and and it, it kind of cuts us off, right? And it doesn't allow us to connect culturally. And that's what we really need to be doing is connecting culturally. And we'll start seeing the intersections, the similarities, 
and it feels like it just feels better very quick comment because we're we're starting to go directions to the end i'm very sorry we, we there's a lot to explore but uh this is my experience with tarot when i because when i started with tarot i i got this deck which at that moment the, i when i received it felt very comfortable because i used to love greek mythology as a kid and then i received the uh the mythological tarot which is basically based on greek mythology but then once i started actually developing all the, the gender studies and the tech study, the studies that i started embracing you will start to realize that greek mythology also like tries to sell this universal truth for these universal sets of symbols but actually ignores a lot of other references and other representations and other stories that are not in greek mythology and it takes quite a long time to you to actually start processing that these stories it's not that I, now that i hate these stories but sometimes they don't fit my life anymore because i'm trying to detach myself exactly from this expectation that there's just one story so yes i i think it's kind of connecting everything we just said about diving into other cultures because there are many different ways and like mark said we've been discussing uh, like how to connect to the world around us for so long so of course there are some truths but uh, like we also said before it's kind of uh we you feel kind of left out when these contracts are not so clear right when you're we, there's not even like fine lines for you to try to understand what's happening because you're just being controlled by something, by some, this force, which we call technology, but in, embraces so much that it's so big that we actually are scared of something that you are not very, you cannot even put your finger on it. Like I'm, I, I myself have been developing this kind of resistance toward technology thinking about having like how much i missed life with just an analog telephone with sms where i just had like 150 characters to say what i needed to say because right now we have all the characters in the world to say and then you just have this avalanches of conversations that has no they don't have no meaning or i don't process them because in the end i don't really connect even with my friends when i'm having this let's not say names of apps this very common application we use to communicate in between ourselves uh because somehow the the characters are there but the intention is not there so kind of it's for me it's it's, it's really what we're talking about is missing the spirit of it because i now have the means but i don't have the intention sometimes I can answer any time at any uh, speed how much text that I want but sometimes I just don't want to because somehow I don't feel connected to it so hopefully we will find solutions for this after this amazing panel <laughs> uh we have like 15 minutes uh, maximum to wrap up I just want to open the floor for like any one of you that wants to maybe propose a question to other participants anything you will still want to debate because I know it seems like a lot of time but in the end it, it's very short also so we need to make use of it the floor is open anyone wants to have a question or debate anything that we still haven't touched please Mark is thinking, ten ten, ten ten, ten ten, Ingrid, Ines, nothing special, no pressure. Well, I have. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I have a question, but it's for Ingrid. But I think it may uh, uh, expand also to our to the rest of the panel and to what we have been discussing Go. Uh, about Dinkanesh and about this this project you are creating it and how do you think it's kind of entangled with the issues we we were talking about it here particularly this last question about ai but also the issues we were discussing about surveillance and and this kind of community building and how do you think that uh, uh because i think the methodology is really interesting so first i would like to know a bit more about it uh if you could share a bit more 
and also within our discussion as well. Sure. Very, very curious. Okay, my pleasure. Uh, there are four phases to the methodology. Uh, I start with identity. Um, the reason is because our godfather, Sun Ra, said, uh, you are a myth. He's talking to black people. Um, and he said, if you were not a myth, you wouldn't have to advocate for human rights. Uh, just really kind of diving into what it means to be black, to define blackness. Um, there's some really amazing um, essay. There's an amazing essay by um, Bayo Kamalafe, who, uh, yes, <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> Definitely look him up. Um, but he really asks us, you know, are we defining blackness in a way that's supporting white supremacy? So these are like some concepts to just kind of reflect on things that we kind of assume, especially when we're black bodied. Um, we think that we already understand our narrative, but we might not. And so this is where I ask people to create their own mythical narrative like Sunra and embody it throughout the workshop. Um, we have a different name and everything. The reason is because I need that being, that entity of that part of you to think outside the box. I want you to be, to, to know that you can do the impossible. And then the second, um, <clears throat> and so there's always gonna be prep and group ex exercises just to know like the basic format. But um, the second part of it is black life. So we're getting into the systems. I think that a lot of us theoretically know the systems that might be oppressing us, but we don't really know. And I think, some people don't even know that there's a concept of racial capitalism. Uh, and we need to know that before we start imagining futures so we don't bring that forward. And that's what this all is about, is like dissecting and really analyzing before we create our future. Uh, the third phase is black magic, and that's when we get into the metaphysics. Um, we get into the magic, the spiritual technologies. We look at our own family history, our cultures, um, and and really bring value to them and talk about like imagining them in their in our futures and what does that look like. Uh, and then the end is continuum, and that's when we um, get into all like the the tech and the science that's on the horizon, um, some of the implications around that. Um, and, uh, and we begin to pull all the elements that we kind of learned from before to world build together. Um, I did it this way is because in foresight, you usually just kind of start like imagining futures, you know, you, you just, you're just, you're, you're definitely, um, scanning in and, and under trying to understand the environment and what's at play but it kind of flatlines like the all the diversity of experiences and to imagine a future you we all know that we don't want to bring our biases into that future we don't want to bring you know some of those negative aspects of the way that we've been thinking and forming our society into the future but we first need to understand that you know and um and i don't think that you know we assume too much. <laughs> we assume too much. And, and so this method is to really kind of lovingly and really fun way um, <laughs> kind of break down those assumptions. Um, and then hopefully we can, you know, just build these great, just wonderful, beautiful, pleasurable futures um, that we all collectively can enjoy. Thank you. Super cool. <laughs> Many thanks. I think we're starting to wrap up. I'm sorry, we don't have any, much more time to continue this conversation forever. But I truly enhance everyone watching us to actually go into the references of that we shared with Ingrid's work, Ines' work. Mark has this incredible blog that I love with actually rituals and the things you've been doing around technology. I actually did the silent supper, which is like felt very, very interesting. And I enhanced everyone to try also, please try to discover what is the silent supper, because I think the discussion on spirituality and technology is endless for sure. I hope everyone at least today got like a glimpse of all the many little discussions there are inside discussing spirituality and technology 
because I think this is the type of um, discussion that we need in terms of creating awareness of what, what's, what's actually happened, what type of technology we want to build and what type of future we, were, like, we want for ourselves. And I'm super proud to, and I thank you again, the panelists, Ines, Mark, Ingrid, for being with us in terms of, I really feel that so today we, we made a very good use of, of technology, of the internet, to literally conjure uh, at the same time and space and matter, like people that are actually thinking about different ways of doing technology outside of this devious ways that some so far has been like have been uh, harming us somehow and has been scaring us somehow also with all the fiction and the black mirrors around like us like always pointing out how bad things can be but i think it's important also to discuss uh what good can we actually create with uh, what we need to incorporate to make good use of um technology any final words that you want to share with the audience, please? This is your moment. Do you want to start, Mark? There's a lovely line from one of my favorite films, Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. In the middle of the film, he reminds everyone, wherever you go, there you are. And it feels like that's part of what we need to remember, that we need to be remain connected, that we bring ourselves, we bring our sacred selves, we bring our profane selves to every interaction with other people and also with all of the technologies. And if we can keep that in mind, and that's hard work, but if we can keep that in mind, then we can bring something to all of those interactions that blesses them. Ingrid. Final remarks. <laughs> oh my. Um, oh my. <laughs> I think that it's important to understand that no one really can disrupt your spirituality and your spiritual practice. And that tech is just a tool that can either enhance it or distract you, but that's your choice. Um, and our future is going to be very bright because we're having these conversations. And thank you so much for, for bringing us together to have this conversation. We definitely need more of these. And as, as we have these conversations collectively, I think that I think our future is going to be all right. We're going to be OK. <laughs> Ines, please. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for organizing this. It was really interesting. Let's see where we go from here, what kind of tech we create and what kind of things appear. I'm curious. I'm also a bit on the cautious uh, side and on the not, let's not be uh, uh, too connected to technology to solve everything. But still, I think there are many interesting things that can come out of it if we continue having these discussions and these kind of conversations. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Again, thank you, Feminist Internet, for actually provoking Marina to develop all these this ideas about spirituality and actually pushing me to do it. I really wanted to have this panel for a long time. So thank you, Feminist Internet, Charlotte, Gigi, Sabrina, and every, Connor, anyone, everyone involved. And again, thank you, CCI, for this amazing space, for giving us all the tech, all the support that we also, it's very important to have like a conversation without having to think about all the possible outcomes of the tech. So CCI was actually pro like providing this for us. Thank you so much. And to remind that if anyone is actually uh, interested in keep this conversation going, one conversation is happening in CCI uh, in the, for one year as the MA of Internet Equalities. Things are very interesting program where you will discover how to make uh, use of technology to make the world a little bit fairer. Thank you so much. Have a good night and we will see each other very soon, hopefully. I will organize something else for us to, to, to chat again. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.